Thank you. Good evening and welcome. So good to see so many here. Our journey tonight is one of my favorites. I think you'll agree it's one of yours by the time we've concluded. Let's fasten, fasten tightly our seat belts. And we shall go to Egypt tonight. We're going to go inside the Great Pyramid. Egypt is a curious place, fascinating place. It's a strange mixture, the old and the new, the ancient and the modern. It's where the East and the West are married together. The city of Cairo, this, by the way, happens to be the University of Cairo, and our guide will be a professor of antiquities here. The city of Cairo is a city of nearly 11 million people, and of those 11 million, almost all who have a faith are followers of Islam. The very few who are Christians are um, mostly uh, Coptic, Egyptian Coptic, which is similar to Roman Catholic in many, many ways, but they make up a very small percentage of the population, not only the city of Cairo, but uh, throughout Egypt as well. We were going down the highway in a bus at about 45 or 50 miles an hour, tour bus, and here streaking by us on the right side is this motorcycle being driven by a man with three children behind him, and they're all waving at us, and I was able to focus and shoot this picture. I thought, that's a record I have never seen four on a motorcycle before. The next day, similar situation, but riding on the motorcycle it was a man. In front of him was a child. Behind him was a child. Behind that child was the mother. And behind the mother, still another child, five on a motorcycle. And I couldn't get the picture quickly enough. Here's a guy that's on the way to the marketplace to pick up a couple of chickens for dinner. Now, I want you to think about it for a moment. I don't think I'd care to carry the chickens on my head in a little thick little cage like that. You get the picture now, don't you? Well, there are others on their way to market. Look at this guy. Now, be reminded, there are cars and trucks and buses and horns are blowing and there are people everywhere. And here's this guy on the apron of the freeway in his own little world, a little cart. And notice down in the bottom of that cart, there is a little hemp hammock, a little rope hammock. There's not one in this one, but I have seen often a little child in their sleep swinging back and forth. And it's like they're in their own world. They're already really very relaxed. But if you think they're relaxed, take a look at this. As the kids would say, kick back and cooled out, chilled. And the horse knows the way to carry the wagon, I guess. Here's a lady who's been to market and bringing the groceries back on her head and her child in her arms. But notice this one. Here is a lady out in the countryside carrying atop her head the bottom quarter of a 55-gallon, a rather, 55-gallon barrel. And I don't know what's in it. Maybe nothing is in it. But I couldn't carry that much steel in my arms, let alone on the top of my head that way. I want to show you the area of the gypsy farmers. The growing season is such that they can grow three different crops here. The growing season is long. All I need to do is put down fertilizer and water and three separate crops. Consequently, then, the farmers live out here during the growing season and then go to their homes perhaps in the city of Cairo, perhaps some other village, to spend the off months, the three months of non-growing season. And here they're caring for some farm animals. And just down the road a ways, there are their summer, their working homes, I should better say, their growing season homes. The roofs are made of corn stalks. It wouldn't keep out the rain, but there's very, very little rain ever here at all anyway. Next to them were a couple of ladies building an addition onto their home. Maybe it's a bedroom for another child who's coming. I don't know. What I do know very well is their building material has been freshly scooped from the barnyard. And it smelled terribly. And they're in it. You can see up to their necks. You just wonder how they keep from getting really, really very ill. I don't know. We had been warned not to get in the water. Don't get any water in your mouth or your eyes. And yet here are the little native boys in the canal swimming with the caribou and just having the best time in all the world. And I discovered that the little boys in Egypt are not unlike little American boys in the heat of summer. They'll go skinny dipping. 
And as we went by, here was this little guy running alongside our bus with his hand out, bakshish, he was shouting, bakshish. Traveling with me was a young man by the name of Joe Krieger. And Joe was holding out a dime. And this little guy ran for about a half a block and Joe just held the dime so he gave up. And when he stopped running, Joe dropped the dime for him. And he caught it on the second bounce. And when he looked up, Joe was holding another dime. After about a mile, I had to bring it to an end. I could see the headlines in the Cairo paper. American preachers run naked native boy to death. <laughs> so I put an end to it. We're coming out here to see the great pyramids. There were dozens and dozens of them. Many of them date back thousands of years. We're going to go inside the great, the largest of all of the pyramids, the pyramid of King Cheops or Khufu. Either name is correct. One is his Greek name and the other is his Egyptian name. Every pagan religion has held within it at least two major non-biblical doctrines. One of them is the idea of sun worship and worshiping the sun on the day of the sun, the first day of the week, Sunday. And the second non-biblical doctrine, the idea that when you die, you don't really die, but a soul or a spirit or a ghost of some sort lives on and goes on to other realms. Some add to that reincarnation. You conquer this world, this life, and then come back as another and another and another. But, but they all have this false teaching, the pagan religions do. And particularly was it exemplified here amongst the ancient pharaohs or kings who believed that when you died, your soul or spirit was released from the body and would go to enjoy other things, wonderful things, they would bury with them all kinds of treasures, toys, games, seeds that they could plant in the afterworld to grow their favorite foods and, and, and gold and treasures of all kinds. And that was the reason for the building of the great pyramids. Now, the Pharaoh was buried right in the very center of the pyramid, equidistant from top to bottom and vertically, and equidistant horizontally right in the very center. It was a part of their religion, you see. This idea of equilibrium and, and yin and yang is not so terribly far removed from it when you go out to China. But in any event, the queens were not so regarded. Their burial chambers were way down beneath these great pyramids. They didn't have equality in life and they didn't have equality in death even though they sat upon the throne as the queen. And so we're going to, after we take a moment to look at the Sphinx, go inside the Great Pyramid. <clears throat> for years, I would ask the folks, find out for me tomorrow night what happened to the nose of the Sphinx, for it is missing. And almost without exception, someone or several would come back with the answer, well, Napoleon's so soldiers blew it off there when they were training in their big guns. And I had heard that and learned that in history. But guess what? Recently, pictures, drawings of the Sphinx that predate Napoleon by at least 100 years are found, and his nose is already gone. What happened to his nose? I don't know. Maybe he had a bad cold and <laughs> went ka -choo. I just don't know. Well, we're going to go inside this great pyramid with this little guy here. Uh, he... Uh, had picked up a little bit of the English language during the World War II years. I suppose he was just a little child, but he knew a few words of language, and our professor who teaches at the university has been inside so many times, and so he turns us over to this gentleman, and he would say to us, follow me closely now, okie dokie, okie dokie, follow Sam, he called himself Sam, follow Sam, okie dokie, okie dokie. And we got back inside, and he began to sing to us, Yankee Doodle went to town. <laughs> oh, he said, I must be fair. Are you from Dixie? I say from Dixie. You know, the Yanks and the folks below the Mason Dixon, he wanted to treat fairly. And so we found our way back through this force part of the tunnel, and eventually we would come to the natural shaft that goes up to the burial chamber. Now you must get down on hands and knees, for the shaft is only about four feet square, 
and you have to climb at an angle that I suppose to have been between 18 and 20 degrees, fairly steep. And here about half of my tour group turned and went back. They said it's too dark, tons and tons of stone over us, and it's claustrophobic, and tons of stone indeed. There are five million stones that make up the pyramid. I'm sorry, I should have said there are three million stones, and they believe that the stones average in weight about 30,000 pounds. That means the ones way up the top are smaller, but those at the base are much, much heavier than that. And so we had to crawl on hands and knees till we got in the very center of the place and then it all opened out. Here is a good picture of the way the big stones fit together. Where you see that white line, that is the joint. And there is no mortar and those stones, tons and tons each, fit so tightly that you couldn't slip a paper in between them. That's some real engineering, seems to me. Now suddenly the place has opened up the shaft overhead is 30 feet high, and it's an inverted V, and we're just steps from the entry to the burial chamber. There it is. We again must get down on hands and knees to go inside. And when we step inside, our first lighted scene is the sarcophagus, or the stone tomb of King Cheops. Long, long ago vandalized, all the treasures and the gems, whatever, taken, stolen away. And... After we had been here for a little while, Sam, our guide, said to us, Shh, shh, be very quiet. Shh. And when it became as hushed as it is now, Sam turned off the lights. Now, I've been in some dark places, folks. I've been in the bottom of the Carlsbad Caverns when they turned the lights out, and, and I've been in other places, but nothing seemed as dark as this place. I mean, it seemed so oppressive. You could cut the darkness with scissors. Shh, Sam continued, shh, quiet. And in a little bit, this is what you could hear. But Lyle heard this. <laughs> oh, I was thankful when they turned the lights on. I felt so very, very good. Sam allowed us to have our pictures taken with him. And then he said, let's get out of here. I said, that's a good idea. And I suggest that we conclude here tonight. Thank you so very much for traveling with me. I Recently, I was channel surfing. When I came across America's foremost psychic, that's the way he's titled these days, and it went something like this. There's an audience much larger than this one. There's a lady here who's just lost her husband. Yes, I understand, ma'am. You're in great grief. I understand that. But your husband is right here with me. He's standing right here beside me. Your dead husband is right here. He's telling me to tell you that he's in a much better place. Please don't worry about him. He's fine, and that you'll be fine. <laughs> oh, he's laughing. Oh, he, he's telling me that... He's telling me that you've been trying to find your red shoes, your red heels, and the lady's jaw drops almost to the floor. He, he's telling me to tell you that, that shortly before his sudden death, he, as a prank, hid your shoes in the garage on a shelf. And if you'll go to that shelf and, and pull some boxes aside, you'll you find the box with your red high heels. And the lady did. And she did. And chalk up hundreds more than, if not thousands, or perhaps multiplied millions, as they watch television, believers, that there is no such thing as death. That death is just a graduation to another plane. That it's just a moving on. It seems that the world, including largely the church, has forgotten the truth, the sad truth, that the devil has assigned to us evil agents. It's true that when we're born, we have a guardian angel that's placed beside us to guide our feet in paths of righteousness and to speak to us with a still small voice. Our guardian angel is also our recording angel, of course, 
but the devil himself has put beside us evil angels to take record of every single thing that we do and encourage us to walk in paths of unrighteousness and evil angels are a party to every little conversation that seemed to have been private, every little action that you thought no one else knew anything about. And so the devil whispers into the ear of the channeler, the spirit medium, and he comes across looking as if he's speaking for God Almighty and again underlining this idea, there is no death, it's only just a graduate graduation ceremony. I get a magazine. I don't know why. It's called AARP. Perhaps some of you folks get it. That's for the Association of uh, Retired People. They tell me why they send it to me. I have no idea. It's for old folks, as I've said. But on the front cover, it says, Life After Death. What do you believe? And then it says, if you read inside, there is a poll. And I'm going to read you just a couple of sentences from the poll. We found that people 50 years of age and older tend to be downright conventional in their basic beliefs. 73% agree with this statement, quote, I believe that there is life after death, immediately at death. Moreover, and then it goes on to say that women are more likely to believe in that idea than men, and I'm not exactly sure about how true that is or how important that it is. I want you now please to open your Bibles to our first scripture for this evening. We're going to go to the writing of the Apostle Paul to a young preacher by the name of Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Please turn there with me. And by the way, I'm just going to say as we begin tonight that I'm going to cover a lot of ground. I'm going to cover a lot of scripture and we won't be able to turn to everyone, but I know that you A students will take notes and we will make available uh, by recording also the information. And I want, again, to encourage everybody to go home and check it out. You check out every preacher that you hear on television. You check out every preacher that uh, comes through town and every revival. And you check out Lyle, be certain. You check everyone by the word. As we've said before, don't uh, go to the preacher and check the Bible out by the preacher. But rather you check the preacher out by the Bible. And then you'll always be safe. Now we're ready to read together. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and the first three verses. Listen very carefully and notice the end time context. Now the Spirit speaks express, expressly that in the last days many are going to depart from the faith, giving heed to... Now you tell me what it says next. What kind of spirits? What kind of deceiving spirits? Would that be the work of the Holy Spirit? Absolutely not. Would that be the work of the evil spirit, the devil spirit? Certainly it is giving who, uh, heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisies, having their consciences seared with a hot iron. They'll forbid some to marry and to tell some that they're to abstain from certain food. Now, let me just give you a thumbnail sketch of what I believe God is saying here. God is saying that there is a religious power in the last day. A power that is prominent. Maybe that's a better way to say it. A religious power or denomination, if you please. You may put it that way if you don't mind. There is a power that, uh, that forbids some to marry and disallows some to eat certain things at certain times of the year and a power that promotes spiritism. Now, I don't know how that part of it at least could be more clear. How could that possibly be more clear? From there, we're going to go without transition to Revelation chapter 16, the last book for those who live in the very last days. And I'm going to begin now to read at verse 13. Revelation 16, verses 13 through 15. Revelation chapter 16, beginning with verse 13. Here in vision, John, overviewing the last days, said, I saw three unclean spirits like... Now you tell me what they were like. They were like frogs. It's not an accident. I think that God through John uses that symbol for in many pagan cultures the frog was an object of veneration. He was an object of worship. And certainly that was the way it was in Egypt. There would come a plague of frogs. The Bible speaks about that. The Exodus is clear about it. The plagues of Revelation speak about it. Frogs everywhere. Frogs underfoot. Hardly could you cross the street without walking on some or many 
And then one day, this plague of frogs would almost suddenly disappear. They would hop down to the riverbank or to the lake shore, to the seabed, and dig themselves a grave and pull it in behind them and die. That's what the pagans believed. And then a few days later, they would come out of their grave with a new suit of clothes. Proof, they believed, that the frog was the evidence that there was no death. Death was only just a transition. And so here in the symbolism, John says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. One came out of the mouth of the dragon, run from the mouth of the beast, one out of the mouth of the false prophet, and then he identifies them for us. These are the spirits of devils that are working miracles. They go to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And then the 15th verse, behold, I come as a thief. Jesus says when you see occultism and spiritism and, and demon worship and this idea of occultism everywhere, not only in these, not only in, out in India somewhere, but, but flooding the universities of the West and being taught from kindergarten through the highest level of the graduate school. When you see that happen, then know that I'm near even at the door. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I believe that the rapid expansion of spiritism throughout the whole world, particularly in this Christian segment of the world, is one of the most certain signs of the imminence of the coming of Jesus. He must come again and come he shall. Spiritism. Where did it begin? Well, we've read from the last book, the Revelation, there's going to be a big problem to the eternal generation, and everyone alive to meet Jesus is going to be tested in this area. Now let's go back to beginning, shall we? Let's go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 3. And in the word Genesis, of course, we have the word genes and genetics and origins. All right? Genesis, chapter 3, and I shall begin here at the first verse. Genesis, chapter 3 beginning at verse 1 and reading down through to the end of verse 5. Now the serpent was more subtle than the other beasts of the field that the Lord had made. And the serpent said to the woman, Yea, has God said you're not to eat of every tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, except for the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. God has said, Don't eat it, don't touch it, lest you die. Now, by the way, my Bible with a center Hebrew margin reference says, Dying thou shalt die. In other words, what God wasn't saying, as soon as you touch the fruit, you're going to drop dead. What he was saying is, as soon as you disobey me in this area, the death process is going to begin. The wrinkles are going to begin. Your hair is going to begin to turn gray, and you're going to die. Death, he is saying, is a total and complete cessation of life. God has told us, don't eat from it, don't touch it lest we die and the serpent said to the woman oh, you won't die you won't surely die by the way there is the hint here of a question well it may seem like you're dead but you're not really dead you, you won't surely no you won't completely die For God knows, verse 5, God knows that in the day you eat the fruit thereof, your eyes will be open, and you shall be, what, help me now please, you shall be God, knowing both good and evil. The original lie. There is no death, and you are God. Now there comes then this question, and it's basic to Christianity. Are you really dead when you die? You ask most in the Christian world, and they'll say, no, you're not dead when you die. For there's a soul or a spirit or some such thing that lives on. And I have news for you. The psychics have made multiplied millions in the last decade by sharing that idea as we alluded with our illustration when we began a little bit ago. The idea of talking with the dead, whether it's through Jonathan Edward or Jay-Z Knight, to whose place I've been over in Yelm, Washington recently. Mediums and channelers are everywhere today. I want to talk to you basically and briefly about Halloween. Halloween originally was based totally and completely in spiritism. The Druid people who lived largely in England and Scotland and Ireland believed that in the fall of the year, the evil, the ugly dead things, the monster sort of things would come back and they would torment you and they would taunt you and they would haunt you unless you treat them. Thus then came trick or treat. Now let me take one step from there. There was a guy by the name of Harry Houdini who did magical tricks that seemed to defy science. And if you've not read a book or two about him, it might not be a bad idea. Harry Houdini died on Halloween of 1926. Every Halloween since his death, 
there has been a gathering beside his grave because he promised to come back. His family members have been there year in and year out. And now to the third and fourth generation to see if he would return. He hasn't made it. Not yet. The first seance happened in the Garden of Eden, as we just read from Genesis, Genesis chapter 3. The first medium was a snake, and the first possession was the devil's taking and speaking, taking hold of and speaking through the body of this snake. And we also find there the first lie, first medium, first possession, the first lie. There is no such thing as death. He deceived Eve. She flunked the test. John chapter 18 and verse 44 says that the devil who told Eve that original lie, there is no such thing as death, John 8, 44 says that he is a liar and he is not only just a liar, he is the father of it. He's the originator of it. And indeed he is. The whole idea of an immortal soul, um, not subject to death, that's the basic interpretation of the idea of an immortal soul. And we've had in the church many, many hymns that carry that idea where the soul never dies, for instance. I've heard it in many churches where the soul never dies. Now look, folks, if there is no such thing as death, and I mean the total cessation of life, then we are now immortal. A man out on the battlefield receives a mortal wound. What does that mean? That means he died as a result of the wound. It was a fatality. We use that phrase synonymously with mortality. It was a fatality, a mortal wound. Now, I want you folks to turn with me to 1 Timothy, please. We were back in Timothy a bit ago and must of necessity go there again tonight. 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the young preacher, his first letter, and uh, we're going to begin to read down at verse 15. 1 Timothy 6, verses 15 and 16, which in his times he shall show, he who is the blessed and the only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, whom do you think it's speaking about here? It's speaking about God Almighty, isn't it? Of course, the context is quite clear. And then in verse 16 it says, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto. And so here, God through the Apostle Paul is telling us that at this point now, God only, God alone, the God family, only has immortality. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, there the same Apostle Paul in the second letter says, and I quote, Jesus appearing will abolish death, it brought life and, and immortality to light through the gospel. The death of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus, will bring to us immortality. From here we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You remember that when we talked about heaven, I said to you ladies and gentlemen that this had become my favorite passage in all of the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51, 52, and 53. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Here God through Paul says, look, I'll show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This corruptible must put on incorruption, and then this mortal will put on... There it is. When do we become immortal? As soon as we die? No, when Jesus comes and we are changed, changed in an instant and given life eternal, given by grace, immortality, instantly and immediately at the second coming of Jesus. Put in your notes there, if you will, please, Romans chapter 2, verse 7, where it says, the same Apostle Paul, it says now that man seeks immortality. We have a longing for We're tired. We're sick of death. We're so tired of going to the graveyard. We're so tired of bearing their hopes and our dreams and our babies. We're sick of it. Man, therefore, seeks immortality. Now listen to me. Why would I seek for something that I already have, huh? Come now. Let us reason together. Said God, 
Now, let, uh, let me rather take your mind back not so very many days as we step back to the future. Our Lord Jesus is on a missionary journey with the disciples when word comes that their dear friend Lazarus is gravely ill. And you read this, by the way, in John chapter 11. Instead of turning immediately around and going back, Jesus continues on and then the really bad news arrives that Lazarus has died. I'm going to have you read with me, if you will, please, John 11 and verse 11. John chapter 11 and beginning to, well, let's see. Maybe we shall begin to, uh, to read, yeah, at verse 11. That'll work just very well. These things Jesus said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I might wake him out of sleep. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus had spoken of his dying, but they thought he was speaking of taking rest in sleep. So Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And he turned around, you remember, went back to Bethany and, and tried to comfort the girls. And he said, I'm going to go to his grave. And the girls said, oh, no, Lord, don't do that. No, please don't. Don't. He's been in there days now and his body is decomposing. It's going to be very unpleasant. Don't even go. But Jesus went to the grave, you remember? And in front of the grave, he called out, didn't he? Huh? Hey, Lazarus, come on back from heaven, my best friend. Come on now. Is that the way it goes? No. Jesus called, Lazarus, come forth, wake up. Many of the new translations say, wake up. And Lazarus came up out of the grave. David is not in heaven. Lazarus didn't go to heaven. The key word in all of the Bible to describe death is the word sleep. You find it again and again and again, dozens, yes, many dozens of times. Martin Luther, one of my great indoor sport, one of my great heroes, Martin Luther, whom I believe to be not only one of the greatest Christians, but certainly one of the greatest New Testament scholars since the time of the Apostle Paul, said this shortly before his own death. He gathered his wife and his children around his bedside, and he said, I'm about to fall into a deep sleep. And the very next voice that I hear will be the voice of Jesus on resurrection morning. He shall be knocking on the door of my little grave and saying to me, Brother Martin, Brother Martin, it's time to get up. How oftentimes I've fallen asleep as a kid on the farm after working 10, 12, 14 hours putting up hay or irrigating or milking or a combination of all of those. It seemed I barely put my head to the pillow and Dad would be calling, Lyle, son, it's time to milk, time to get up. It seemed I'd hardly close my eyes. You've had that experience. I know you have, and the rest of you have as well. You know, folks, death is only painful to those that are left behind, and Peggy and I have learned that again recently. Death is not a problem for those who die with their faith in Jesus. It shall be to them just an instant. The very next voice I hear, the very next thing that will happen, I hear the voice of Jesus calling, it's time to get up. But for those that are left behind to grieve and to weep and, and, and to see the, the empty place at the table and, and the clothes that hang unused, for those, it's most painful. I've mentioned it before and I'm going to do it again tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Don't let your kids watch Harry Potter and don't let your kids read Harry Potter. And if you have the books in the house or in the garage, get them out. Get them out. They are filled, shot through, absolutely saturated with spiritism and demonism. And we teach the kids not only at church, we teach them at school, we teach them through the movies, and we teach them in every way possible. I was out in the Philippines when I learned this story. Now let me ask you to think through this scenario and ask your own heart, would I have the courage that this family had? They were only recent Christians and recently had adopted the truth that when you die, your soul is dead, your, your spirit, your breath goes back to God and there's nothing that lives until resurrection. Our Lord Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life and there is no life of the dead until first there is a resurrection. But this young Filipino family had two beautiful little girls, preschoolers, and they went on a ride with some friends and a bus hit them and they were instantly killed. 
And you can imagine the breaking hearts. Only just imagine. That's all we can do. I used to go to visit the grieving and those that had lost children and their spouses, and, and I could sympathize with them. But now I'm able to empathize. And I've had some who've said, well, I know what you're going through, and they don't have any idea unless they've been there. And one night at the worship hour, this husband and wife were together, and through the front door of their house came those two little girls. And one walked in and sat on mother's lap, and the other went over and threw her arms around daddy's neck, got on his lap. Would you have the courage that that family, that mother and dad had to say, Get thee behind me, Satan? And instantly the apparitions were gone. Instantly they were gone. Now, Revelation 16, as we read a while ago, says that each one of us is going to be tested and tempted, each one who's alive. Every member of the terminal generation is going to be tested and tempted in this area. Are you ready? In medieval times, during the Dark Ages, heathenism flooded the church. The standards of the church were lowered, and we talked about that again and again and again. And the Bibles were taken away from the people, and what few Bibles were left from the burnings were chained to monastery desks, and they were for the interpretation only of the priest and the prelate. And the folks would go and ask the priest, what does the Bible say? And the priest would tell them, well, the Bible says this and this and this, and it didn't necessarily say that at all. I'm going to tell you folks something tonight. You take away folks' Bibles, you, you disallow them having Bibles, and pretty soon you're going to see the result. And we've taken away the Bibles to the large degree, not by force and not by law, not by the church, but by personal choice. We've taken away the Bibles. They've taken away my Lord. I think I mentioned to you on another night, Mary cried at the tomb, and I don't know what they've done with him. And sometimes I feel that same way. You take away the Bible, and you soon have paganism. You take away the Bible, and you soon have ignorance. And you take away the Bible, and you soon have poor health, and you have poor hygiene, and you have death. And you also, when you take away the Bible, have spiritism and paganism. No doubt about it. As a result of this teaching that when you die, you don't die, the church became fabulously and quickly very wealthy. You see, there came into the church when the Bibles were done away with a doctrine called purgatory. Purgatory. When one dies, one doesn't really die, but there's a spirit or soul that goes on somewhere, goes perhaps to eternal torment. And then you had guys like Dante, of whom we spoke on another evening, who embellished it and, and described the torment of the fires of hell. And then they began to sell indulgences so that folks could be brought out of the purging or out of the fire more quickly. Can you imagine? Peace was promised for money. The never dying soul could roast and fry and burn and burn and burn and burn forever and ever and ever. And folks would mortgage the farm. They would give up anything to have their, their loved ones prayed out of the fire, prayed out of purgatory. Saints immediately going to heaven. It's taught tonight just like it was back then. Now listen, folks. If it's true that when we die, we instantly go to heaven, then my suggestion is that we do away with all of the doctors and all of the hospitals, huh? Why, why do you go and pay those high hospital bills when if you died, you'd immediately go to heaven? Why would I preach to you here from night after night when really probably what I ought to do is have someone set off a bomb and send us all to heaven, huh? When they caught finally Charles Manson, I was working down in Southern California about the time that it happened, I'll tell you. And when they brought him to trial, and Vincent Bugliosi looked him in the eye and said to him, Charlie, in God's name, why did you do it? Why? And with that demonic grin and with those devilish eyes, he laughed and said, hey, man, you ought to give me a trophy, man. You ought to give me a reward, man. I just sent him to be with Jesus a little early, man. I just sent him to heaven a little early, man. And son of Sam, David, son of Sam from New York City, said the very same thing. And the terrorists who blow up our buildings are promised immediately a death, 70 virgins. And I can't see how that would be heaven, but some evidently do. By the way, I'm going to speak tomorrow morning on this, uh, the importance of the home in these end times. I pray all of you will be here. 
And in case one of you can be, I'm going to tell you right now, the test of manhood is not seeing how many women you can score with, but rather the real test is to see if you can make one woman happy for a lifetime. Try that one. When my boy died, there were scores and scores who sent cards or letters or phone calls or, or in person they said, but Terry's in a better place. Terry is asleep in Jesus, waiting the call of the life giver. And that's why the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 would say, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Those who believe that when you die, you go into leave heaven. Death is an enemy for them. Those who believe that there will be 70 virgins, death is an enemy to them. The Charlie Manson, death is not an enemy to them. Socrates, death was not an enemy. Therefore, then drink gladly the hemlock. Let me have, bring it on, man. You contrast that with the death of Jesus, who in the garden agonized. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. <clears throat> Please. Ecclesiastes 9, verses 5 and 6. And I plan for us to turn there to read, but there's not time. The living know that they're going to die, but the dead know not anything. Nothing, nothing. Verse 10, the same passage. Whatsoever your hand findeth to do, do it with your might, for there is no death or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you go. Job chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. It says there, the one who dies cannot go back to his house, can't return home. He's asleep. There's no way he can go back home. And therefore, the Ghostbusters, and you see them on television with all of their scientific machinery, don't you now? And they test the light and they test the darkness and they test the sound waves and they test with ultraviolet and they test in all kinds of ways. See if there's some kind of a spirit out there. And the ghostbusters and the death, dead seekers are all a part of a cruel hoax. And the channelers and the mediums are joining it as well. Now someone says, but I read in the Bible from our Lord Jesus himself uh, that today you'll be with me in paradise. Let's turn, if you will, please, Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, and we're going to have to hurry now. Luke chapter 23 finds our Lord Jesus on the cross, and he's between two thieves. They're there because of what they have done, paying for their sins. Jesus is there to pay for mine. Luke chapter 23, I'm going to begin at the 19th verse. Then one of the thieves, which is hanged, railed upon Jesus and said, If you're the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked the first and said, Don't you fear God? Seeing that we're in the same condemnation, we deserve it. For we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then Jesus said to him, No, oh, I'm sorry. Let me back up. Verse 42. <clears throat> and he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom and jesus said unto him verily i say today shalt thou be with me in paradise now you read it like it's punctuated in most bibles and you have jesus saying you're going to be with me instantly in paradise but i've got news for you my dears the punctuation in the bible is not inspired it is not it was placed there in modern times by translators and I used to preach a sermon where I began here, preaching on this subject. I called it the case of the misplaced comma. Kind of a Perry Mason sort of an approach, you know. The case of the misplaced comma. You can take that text and move the comma just one word and you have Jesus saying something quite different. I say to you today, in this bleak hour, today, when we have nails in our hands and our feet and it seems so helpless and so hopeless, I tell you in this situation, you will be with me in paradise. Now, there's much more than just that idea. I have as much right to put the comma there as the man who put it on the other side, but that doesn't make it right. But there is further information. When did the thief expect Jesus to save him? Did he expect him to take him to heaven that day? No. Lord, remember me when you come as king. When does Jesus come as king? He comes as king with a crown on his head of the second coming, of course. And that's when the thief expected Jesus to save him. But there is further information. By the way, if you want a scripture that proves that there are mistakes in punctuation, put this down in your notes. You may have a smile. Acts chapter 19, verse 12, where it says, They brought to the apostle Paul sick handkerchiefs and aprons. <laughs> Jesus. 
John 19. John chapter 19, verses 31 through 34, tells the rest of the story. At the end of that Friday, they came to break the legs of the thieves. Now, in the Bible, one day begins and the other ends when? When the sun set here in the western sky this evening, according to the Bible, it is now Saturday. All right? So when the sun set on that Friday, in other words, for Jesus to have taken the thief to heaven, he would have had to have been dead by sundown. But the record of the Bible is abundantly clear that when they came to the thieves, they were still very much alive and they broke their legs so they wouldn't run off and they'd be able to put them back on the cross on Saturday night after the sun had gone down. And then in John chapter 20, verse 17, John 20, 17, Mary of Magdala, the last at the cross, is first at the open tomb. And at first she thinks that they have vandalized his tomb and taken away his body. And then she sees him, he speaks her voice, Mary and she runs to throw her arms around him and, and never let him out of her sight. And he says, you can't hold me here. I have not yet ascended to my father. We have not only the proof uh, from John 19 that the two thieves were still alive there uh, when Saturday came. We have the evidence by the word of God Almighty. Jesus himself said on Sunday morning, I've not yet been to heaven. He couldn't have taken the thief there on Friday because he was not there on on Sunday yet even well say then there's that parable from Luke 16 the rich man and Lazarus and that's exactly what it is ladies and gentlemen you try to take a teaching of death from that parable and you have some serious serious problems a parable was given by, by the way I studied for two years parables and for about six months I preached on worship morning nothing but the parables a parable was given to make one point to teach one idea. It was never a shotgun blast. It was to teach one thing. And when the verses preceding speak to the problem, it's about money. And you probably remember that. Jesus himself said, you can't worship both God and mammon. All right? So that's the context of Luke 16. The Jews had the mistaken notion that if you were poor, God didn't like you. If you were poor and sick with some horrible disease, God really disliked you. And so God takes that whole idea and turns it around. And he takes the poorest guy, and he's not only poor, he has sores all over him, and he takes him to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man goes to the fire. Now, it says that he went there with eyes, the rich man, he could see. No one who believes that when you die, a soul or spirit lives on believes that the body lives on. Well, you can exhume that a week or two later. But in this parable, he had a body, he had eyes. Uh, oh, and tell him to bring some water and put it on the tip of my tongue. Tip his finger in water... Uh, uh, he had, a, he had uh, a tongue. You see, it's a parable. To try to use it as a teaching of what happens at death is to trist, twist the Scripture terribly and horribly. Oh, someone says, but you're forget. You're trying to duck by 2 Corinthians chapter 5. No, I'm not. Let's go there right now. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I can't begin to tell you how many times I have been confronted by this one. And folks say, aha. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, begin with the first verse. For we know that if our earthly house, this tabernacle, were destroyed, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our house which is from heaven. If so, being clothed, we will not be found naked. We are in this tabernacle, and while in this tabernacle we groan, being burdened. Not to be unclothed, but rather to be clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up, a life. Im that we, we might, you know, not longer be subject to death, but, but have immortality. That's the context. Now, he has wrought in us the self-same thing God has. He's given us the, the guarantee by the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, therefore then, I, I have confidence uh, to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. Now, what is he saying here? He's putting together a contrast, and the third part of it, everyone who uses this to try to teach that you, when you die, you go to heaven, misses. Every single person, oh, and for your information's sake, uh, Philippians 1.23 is saying the same thing. UA students will note it down. Now, here's what God, through the Apostle Paul, is saying. <clears throat> While you're here on the earth, you have this earthly body. But one day, you're going to have a heavenly body. It, it, while you're in this earthly body, you're absent from God. When you're absent from the, this body, you'll be present with the Lord. 
But what folks fail to see and to recognize, or if they recognize it, to share it, they fail to share at least, that there is this intermediate stage that is referred to as a dissolved tabernacle, the dust-to-dust -dust idea, the naked state, the unclothed state, death. The same Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 said, We must all appear before where? Before the judgment seat. When do we appear before the judgment seat? At the end of all things. What if at death one was sent immediately to hell and at the end of the age, at the end, there comes the final great judgment, maybe 500 years later, and they study the record and say, oh, I'm afraid we sent Bill to the wrong place. Say, hey, I'm sorry, Bill. Let us reason together. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone receive the things done in the body, whether that be good or evil. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, note it down. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. The same apostle Paul had talked about being absent from the body. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, oh, we've got to read this one. It's an absolute necessity. The last letter from the prison just before the apostle dies. Chapter 4, beginning at verse 6. He's writing to the young preacher and he's saying goodbye. He's signing off. He's saying, I hope that I get to see you, but if you don't make it before the winter storms, I'll never see you again in this life. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 6 and following. I am ready now to be offered. The time of my leaving is at hand. I fought a good fight and I finished the course and I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all those who love his what now? He's talking about the, the second coming of Jesus, of course. The context is abundantly clear. The Apostle Paul said that, that he's going to be given his final reward when Jesus comes in his second coming. You read, by the way, if you will, please, Titus chapter 3 and verse 13. Peggy wants me to be sure to include this little thing that she found when our boy died a few weeks ago. Looking forward in faith to the eventual reunion is the subtitle. The thought of never again seeing a loved one in the flesh is difficult to accept. But just as all matter is transformed into new life, the unique spirit of your loved one is preserved forever in the very heart of God. Their memory will never be gone from the heart of God. With the promise of resurrection, we can look forward to a future reunion in which all of our relationships are restored. All sorrows are ended. Therefore, we await the resurrection with hope and joy. Someone says, well, that, that you're sharing tonight that when you die, you, you don't go to heaven. Or, it seems so cruel. Well, now, wait a minute. Think it through with me. Our Lord Jesus said, broad is the way and wide is the gate that leads to hell. And the majority go down that road and through that gate to the wrong place. While on the other hand, he said, narrow is the gate and narrow is still the road that leads to eternal life and few there be it that find it you put that truth of jesus with the lie of the devil that when you die you don't really die but a soul or a spirit goes somewhere where have most of our loved ones gone they've gone to hell to roast and fry i'd rather believe that my loved ones whether they died in a saved or lost condition are sleeping waiting the final judgment and to believe that the majority of them roasting and burning anything cruel about that i don't think so i don't think so i want to recommend something to you as i move to my conclusion a buddy of mine has written a little book it's not so very big but i want to tell you it's worth its weight in gold and more it's called the search for the eternal soul and the author is um, my classmate and, and my fellow pastor and my buddy through the years his name is daniel knoft and you can find his little book i looked it up Torchlight Intelligence, Torchlight Intelligence, Post Office Box 135, Fall City, Washington, 98024, or you can phone area code 208-371-2908, The Search for the Immortal Soul. It covers the history of heathenisms coming into the church with this idea that when you die, you don't die. And it covers all of these texts that seem to teach something different. And it does a far better job than I have done tonight. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16 
We've said before, these are the scriptures that save us from Antichrist. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17, and 18. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet our Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. My boy Terry is asleep in Jesus. He's resting beside his grandfather, whom in this life he loved so very much. Peggy's daddy is one of the greatest guys I ever knew in my life. And they're sleeping together side by side until Jesus comes. And Peggy's daddy, who was killed in a logging accident 40 plus years ago, didn't go to heaven ahead of us. And Terry didn't go to heaven ahead of us. But one day, we're all going to go together, all of us together. And we'll see Jesus together. We'll meet him together at the same time, together. And we'll build new homes together. Wherefore, comfort one another. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for this truth that saves us from the deceptions of the devil. You're clear, both Old and New Testaments, every chapter, every verse, that death is asleep, a peaceful sleep until resurrection. None of our loved ones have gone before us, preceded us. None of our loved ones are burning in hell fire. They're all awaiting one of two resurrections. Hasten the day, Lord, we so long to be caught up together as family units to meet you in the air and then bask in the sunlight of your face. Hurry home, Lord. We need you in Jesus' name. Amen.